College, Alexis Wolf, who joined us this winter and took on the task of organizing a public program and working with Mr. Zions to bring him here to Olympia to speak today. And we're losing Alexis to France, leaving Friday or Saturday, so we're sorry to see her go, but she's done a terrific job. And thank you, Alexis, and I will welcome you to introduce our speaker today. It is my privilege to introduce today Mr. Alvin Zients. Mr. Zients has recently completed a personal memoir describing his many years defending Native treaty rights in the Northwest, particularly his position as the senior attorney defending Northwest tribes in U.S. versus Washington, better known as 1974's Bolt decision. That historic ruling affirmed tribal treaty fishing rights worldwide. Mr. Zients began his career as an attorney in private practice in Seattle with a special interest in sovereignty issues. Alice stated that it was serendipity that led him to work with Native rights. His journey began by working with the Macaw tribe in the northwest corner of our state, which led to his continued involvement in the fight for Native fishing rights. Alice described the Indian fishing rights movement as akin to the civil rights movement of the mid-20th century. Please welcome Al, Mr. Zients, as he comes today to share his story of a lifetime working for Native rights. Thank you. Well, Coming to Olympia brings back many memories because this was the scene of some of the main battlegrounds of the Indian fishing rights struggle of the 60s and the 70s. And I describe these in the book, and one in particular stands out in my mind. Um, it was a case brought against four Indian people. I see if I can remember all their names. Nugent Kautz, Suzanne Satyakam, um, I don't remember them all, but they're in my book. And they were being prosecuted in Thurston County Superior Court for interfering with an officer and illegal net fishing. Um, they were members of the Puyallup tribe and the Nisqually tribe. They actually launched their boat from Frank's Landing on the Nisqually River. I got involved because I was a member of the ACLU and the American Civil Liberties Union had been trying to think through how this struggle fit into the civil liberties framework because civil liberties is generally viewed as an individual rights phenomenon based on the Bill of Rights. So where does treaty rights fit in? And I and another member of the board worked through this and came to a position that they eventually adopted, that treaty rights for Indians was the equivalent of the basic right to life, liberty, and property, uh, because it was a survival right. And it was not a property right, but it was a way of life. So, when these people were originally arrested in 1965, um, the district court judge held the case in abeyance until a Supreme Court decision came down definitively explaining just what was the scope of the treaty right. Well, there were three Supreme Court cases and none of them completely cleared the issue up, so we went to trial. And I remember being here in 1969 and arguing that case, presenting the evidence. Um, the state put on their usual case, state fisheries patrol officers took the stand and explained how they had witnessed these people putting their net in the water illegally and how they had tried to uh, evade arrest when the fisheries patrol officers tried to arrest them. And uh, as far as they were concerned, that was the, the whole story. But I knew there was a lot more to the story. And so uh, when I cross-examined these officers one by one, I asked if there wasn't a melee that followed. And they 
reluctantly admitted, yes, there was some struggling. I said, I asked, did you use any weapons? They said, oh, no, of course not. I said, didn't you use any flashlights to strike these Indians? No. Did you use any billy clubs? No. Well, I was not asking that question idly because I had in my arsenal photographs taken by a local news reporter of officers hitting Indians with billy clubs, a billy club, and flashlights. And in fact, one of the Indian people on the shore had snatched that billy club away from the officer. And when the officer was on the stand, I introduced that in evidence, and I asked him if this was his. And he could hardly deny it because his name was on it. Um, and he said, yeah, that's my slapper. And I said, what do you mean by a slapper? He said, well, sometimes you have to slap people with it. And it was a leather um, flexible club with a heavy lead weight in the end. If you smacked yourself on the palm with that, you would sting. It would, you would feel it. After he admitted that it was his and that it was taken from him at the scene of this arrest, I passed it around to the jury members, and they experimentally tried it on their hands. And I could see the looks on their faces when they handed it back. Um, then I called Indian witnesses who testified that they had been struggling to assert treaty rights all their life, that the state of Washington had systematically deprived them of the right to fish at usual and accustomed places, despite their federal treaty. And they were forced to sneak, to fish at night, to try to evade the fisheries patrol officers. But on this occasion, they said, they were not sneaking. They went out in broad daylight because, they said, it was not for the purpose of fishing. It was for the purpose of demonstrating their treaty right. And for them, it was a First Amendment freedom of expression right. And they said that the net that they used was an old, ragged, torn net, which couldn't have caught anything anyway. Um, that case ended in a victory. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty in a very short period of time, and it was a very nice ending. But it didn't end the fighting. And the state of Washington continued to try to impose its view of what the law was. And their view was that treaty rights had been superseded somehow. They didn't exist. Uh, and the state, state court judges used a variety of arguments. They claimed that when the state was admitted to the union, that um, superseded the treaty. Well, that was nonsense. Uh, but their main argument was that uh, the state, the U.S. Supreme Court had allowed them the, to stop Indian fishing for the purpose of conservation. And their position was everything they were doing was for the purpose of conservation. Now, in all of the cases that had come to the courts previously, it was a case of a lone Indian facing the whole array of state biologists and state experts, all of whom testified with all of the weight that a professional degree gives you that this was necessary for conservation, that net fishing on the rivers would destroy the runs, and that the runs could only be preserved if the escapement up the river was allowed to continue uninterrupted. And that worked until 1970. By that time, there had been enough public demonstration. There had been beatings. There had been tear gassing. The story had moved off the sports pages. When I first began working in Indian affairs, the only place you ever read about Indian fishing was on the sports pages. And usually it was uh, with a headline that said, Indian poachers arrested. And if there was ever any mention of the treaty, it was in a very disparaging way. The Indians claimed some old treaty. Um, well, that didn't change until 1964. And that was a result of action taken by two young Indians, a macaw named 
Bruce Wilkie, Jr., and a Quinault named Hank Adams. The two got together and decided that it was time to take the initiative, be aggressive, and get publicity. And they got in touch with Marlon Brando. And Marlon Brando said, I'll come up there and help you. And in 1964, he came to Tacoma, got in a boat with Bob Satyakam, went out on the Puyallup River and uh, with a clergyman, and they were all arrested. I was there because Bruce had asked me to be there to help bail out Brando and Satyakam if necessary. So we went to the jail where they were taken, Pierce County Jail, and uh, in a fairly short time, they were released. And I didn't understand what had happened. The jailer said, well, we got a call from the prosecutor saying he wasn't going to prosecute because this was just a publicity stunt. Well, it certainly was. But it was a stunt that made headlines across the country. Pictures of Marlon Brando in a boat with Indians, that was news. And from that point on, the news moved off the sports pages onto the news pages, and it stayed there. Eventually, the federal government became somewhat embarrassed because repeatedly the question was being asked, where is the federal government? Why are you leaving the Indians to defend themselves? This is, after all, a federal treaty, isn't it? Um, that question was even asked by Washington State Supreme Court judges. At the same time, this was during the height of the Cold War, and the Soviet Union was accusing the United States of mistreating its own native peoples, that it could hardly throw stones when its own house was not in order. All of those things combined to bring the Interior Department and the Justice Department to the conclusion that they couldn't tolerate this any longer, that the United States had to act. So finally, uh, the Interior Department filed a litigation report, which is a report that the senior attorney for the, for the Interior Department files, outlining the legal issues and requesting the Justice Department to act. And the Justice Department acted. And the case we all know is US v. Washington. That's how it started. And for this first time, the Indians were not standing alone. The tables were turned. The state of Washington was standing alone. The full force of the United States government was arrayed against them. And it was not a case of the Indian case being overwhelmed by scientific evidence that they couldn't confront. But the federal government and engaged the services of an ethno-historian named Barbara Lane, who was a scholar uh, who had a background in anthropology and ethno-history, and who had done very deep research into the background, the history of the treaties. So we went to trial in the courtroom of Judge George Bolt in Tacoma. I was one of five lawyers who were sitting at the table and I have to admit, we were scared to death because the things we had heard about Judge Bolt did not make for comfort. We perceived him as an extremely conservative guy, unlikely to be sympathetic to Indian rights. Well, the outcome shows you that you can't always predict what a judge is going to do. He started off with a very clear idea of where he was going. He said that he felt that this dispute had gone on too long, that it had created such rancor and ill will and hostility against Indian people. The atmosphere in the state of Washington towards Indians was toxic. Being an Indian of any age in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was very uncomfortable, particularly in the fishing communities around Puget Sound. Um, Bolt saw it as his duty as a judge to grab this dispute by the four corners and decide all the issues once and for all. And for that 
purpose, he directed the parties to prepare a complete biological report, meaning that the biologists were to assemble all of the data regarding fisheries management on all the rivers and streams of Puget Sound, on the straits, and on the coast. So it was no longer going to be a story of a single river or a single stream. It was going to be the entire system of fisheries. It turned out to be surprisingly uh, uncontroversial because the biologists were not lawyers. They were biologists. And when they sat down together to assemble all the data, it was relatively easy. They compiled a biological report that showed exactly how the state managed the fishery. And it showed pretty clearly what we had been advocating, that the state had allocated all the fish, the harvestable fish, to the non-Indian fisheries, to the sports fishery, to the commercial fishery, and leaving only an escapement that was necessary for replacement and therefore making the rivers out of bounds for the Indians so that the conservation necessity was manufactured by the state. Uh, it was done in order to pacify powerful interest groups, sports and commercial fishermen. And don't ever underestimate how powerful these groups are. In those years, the steelhead fishermen had practically established a government within the government. The game department of the state of Washington was basically run by an appointee of a board made up of sportsmen. Uh, the game department operated through license fees paid by sportsmen. And the game department saw its function to preserve the steelhead for the sportsmen and nobody else. Um, the game department was the most adamant, the most resistant to any suggestion that the Indians had any treaty rights to these fish. They came up with such wacky theories that I wondered how they could address the judge with a straight face. Uh, the treaty, many of you will remember, the Stevens treaties made in the 1850s, five of them, uh, were basically real estate transactions. They were deals made to get the Indians off the land so that it would open the West up for settlement. And to do that, they had to agree to reserve small areas for the Indians called reservations. And they also knew that Indian people here in the Northwest had to be able to move to the different streams and rivers following the runs as they returned. So they drafted a master treaty, which contained the language that was incorporated in every treaty, which is the right to take fish at usual and accustomed places is hereby secured to the Indians in common with the white citizens of the territory. And that last phrase turned out to be the hook on which the state tried to hang its hat, saying in common with meant no different than. So if it was not legal for a non-Indian to put a net in the river, then it was not, not legal for an Indian. Um, that theory, that argument, was basically blown out of the water by Dr. Lane, who testified as to what the Indians' understanding was at the treaty negotiations, that that language was inserted only to make sure that the Indians couldn't exclude non-Indians but not that they gave up any rights. In fact, the understanding was quite the opposite, that they reserved all the rights they had always had. And that was the ultimate finding of Judge Bolt. Um, the decision came out in 1973. Uh, when it came out, some of you will remember that it landed like a bomb. It made headlines. The non-Indian fishermen were outraged. They considered it a violation of what they thought was equal protection, which meant no special rights for Indians. And there was something close to rebellion. Uh, Judge Bolt was hanged in effigy. 
there were violent attacks made on his decision. And at that time, the attorney general, who was directing the legal forces of the state, was Slade Gorton. And Slade Gorton took the position that Judge Bolt was simply wrong, and they were going to get it reversed on appeal. And they told the fishermen that. They didn't tell them to obey the order. They said, this is an aberration. We're going to get this reversed. Well, they fell on their face. Uh, the Ninth Circuit reviewed that decision and upheld it completely. If one would think that that would put an end to it, you would be wrong. The sports and commercial fishermen continued to defy Judge Bolt's ruling, and case after case was brought when the state fisheries officers would occasionally try to arrest or stop a white fisherman from violating the court order. And when they brought those cases to state court judges, the state court judges said, we don't have any authority to enforce that federal judge's order. Our authority is limited to conservation. His order is for allocation. So we're not going to enforce it. And the result was chaos. Fishermen. Fishing boats were going out all over Puget Sound, wherever, whenever they pleased, ignoring all the limits, all the rules. And Judge Bolt was faced with an absolute defiance of his decree. And he took some action which was utterly courageous. He placed the entire fishery under federal court receivership. And he ordered federal fisheries enforcement officers to go out on the water and enforce the decree. That meant the Coast Guard, National Marine Fisheries Service, all federal agencies. And fishermen were soon being hauled before US magistrates and being charged with violating federal court orders. It didn't take very long for the defiance to stop, but it gave rise to another case and that was the case that ended up in the US Supreme Court. And in 1979, the US Supreme Court looked at this case, upheld Judge Bolt in every respect, and in the process affirmed what the Ninth Circuit had said, that outside of the civil rights actions of southern states, the court had never seen such open defiance of federal courts. Now, that's a dark chapter in the history of the state of Washington. Uh, I can tell you, as a person who was personally engaged in this, it soured me on the state of Washington. I had thought my state was a liberal, humanitarian, generous state. What I saw was a police state that was acting on behalf of a narrow interest group. <clears throat> Well, I've since cooled down, and I've come to love the state again. But those were dark years. Um, one can legitimately ask, well, what did that decision accomplish? What changes were wrought? Huge changes, huge. First of all, it made fishing a practical way of making a living again for tribes that had subsisted on fishing and part of, it was part of their history and their tradition for thousands of years. And more and more Indian people who had left the reservation because there was no way to make a living came back to the reservation. They were, some of them had to enroll in the tribe again. The tribe was careful about who they would enroll because after all it meant sharing the fish resource among more and more people. But you could trace the growth in the Indian fishery from the years before the Bolt decision to the years afterward, and it was a straight line up until it reached the level that Judge Bolt had set, which was 50%. Now, that didn't bring instant wealth to the Indian communities, but it did make some fundamental changes in Indian life. Um, 
Indians had fished on the rivers in skiffs and canoes with nets. Now they could go out in the marine waters. They could get bank loans and buy a commercial boat. They learned how to use the equipment of a commercial fishing boat, which, if you know anything about it, is not a simple matter. You have to understand diesel engines, gas engines. You have to understand electronics, hydraulics. You have to be a pretty good business person to manage the boat, pay your insurance premiums. And I can tell you that in the case of the tribe that I represented, the Macaws, we helped them get a fleet of 10 boats through a Small Business Administration loan. The tribe applied for the loan, got the loan, and then sold the boats to tribal members on a contract which required that they make payments on those boats. If they failed to make a payment, the boat would be repossessed. And the tribe was very tough. And a number of the fishermen were not diligent. You have to really work hard to be a good fisherman. And they would leave their boat tied up at the dock. And they didn't go out. They didn't make any money. They missed their payments. And the tribe took the boat away from them. This raised a hue and cry. Many of them said that the tribe should give the boats to their members. The tribe said, we borrowed this money. We put the tribe's credit on the line. You signed a contract. And we're going to give this boat to somebody who will fish it and make payments. It took time. It took some years. But gradually, over time, a, a new generation of young Indians learned the skills of commercial fishing. Today, there are Indian fishing boats that are fishing up in Alaska. But there, some of them are operating 60-foot uh, purse seiners. And they know how to run those boats. And they have brought prosperity, relative prosperity, to their communities. Now, if you visit most of the Indian communities around Puget Sound and on the coast, you will still see plenty of poverty. Uh, not all fishermen get rich, but some have. And you can see the benefits that have been distributed throughout the community. Perhaps the most important change that that decision wrought was it required that the state of Washington treat the Indian tribal governments as governments and deal with them as equals, as co-managers of the resource, an idea that was anathema to state fisheries managers before the Bolt decision. It began slowly, but eventually the state began to see the benefit because the Indians had the data right at their doorstep. They could provide fresh information on fish runs to the state, to a central clearinghouse that the state had never had before. Uh, eventually, the state got used to the idea that they couldn't really impose regulations unilaterally as they had. They had to sit down with the tribes. And that began to carry over into other areas of natural resource management, water rights, timber, um, stream conservation, you can hardly pick up the newspaper today and read an article about uh, logging or fishing or water rights without seeing the phrase tribal government in there. They're involved in all of these issues. That was a result of the Bolt decision. Judge Bolt is a hero of mine. I think he was a great judge. And I think I'll stop there. I invite questions because my book covers a lot more than the Bolt decision. Uh, yes, sir. What are your views on um, the federal recognition of tribes? Because the Bolt decision affected fairly recognized tribes, but non fairly recognized tribes were not, did not benefit from it. I don't know if you all heard the question. Um, he asked my opinion about recognition of tribes. <clears throat> that word recognition is very important because if you're not federally recognized, you don't get federal benefits. Um, it's almost like a diplomatic recognition of a nation. Um, tribal recognition has become a very complex bureaucratic 
procedure. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has issued regulations that set down strict requirements that tribes must meet in order to get federal recognition. The most difficult one, in my opinion, is showing that they have had continuous political uh, con connections with the original tribe from the time of the treaty to the present. In some cases, that's almost impossible to show. Uh, but other tribes have met that standard. Now, one can argue that the federal government should be more generous and liberal with that. Um, there are strains in that area, and they don't come just from non-Indians. Tribes themselves are jealous of their rights, and they're not eager to see groups of people that they don't regard as tribal members anywhere coming forward and saying, we're a tribe. And particularly because it means that that entitles them to share in treaty rights. And in some cases, these are tribes that were part of the Stevens Treaty process, but chose not to go to the reservation that was set aside for them and stayed on ancestral lands. So tribes like uh, Quinault, Lummi, Quileute, uh, oppose recognition for other tribes. Now that's not so nice. We'd like to think all Indians are warm and fuzzy and friendly towards other Indians, but they're very possessive about their identity and their rights, and they are not so happy about a group of people coming forward and saying, we're Indians and we want to be recognized. That's all I can tell you on that subject. This gentleman back here. Uh, regarding, uh, let's see, you said in 65 there was the first arrest here with fishing. Um, I've read most of your book, and it seems like you kind of make an analogy of what was going on here was like the civil rights in the South, maybe Selma. Um, can you talk a little bit about other people, that, other Native people that were real uh, pioneers as far as um, fishing rights being arrested, for example, um, McLeod's perhaps? Yeah. Well, the case that I mentioned here in Thurston County was really not the first case by a long shot. The first case arose out of the actions of Bob Satyakam, who was a Puyallup Indian, and uh, he came out of the Army and... Uh, he was very angry that he couldn't fish when he knew that his people had a treaty. And he decided to take the state on almost single-handed. He went out on the Puyallup River in broad daylight, which was shocking because people were simply unaccustomed to seeing an Indian with a net in the river. Uh, Satyakam was the guy who, starting in 1957, brought the first of a series of cases that ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court. So the, the fight actually began then. Uh, it was joined by others. Billy Frank, uh, as you all know, was a passionate defender of treaty rights and was arrested numerous times for his fishing on the, Nisqu on the Nisqually River. The Muckleshoots also were very vigorous in defending their rights. So it was by no means this little small group that I mentioned. There were many others. But the reason that I liken it to the civil rights movement in the South is that as the Indian movement gathered steam, it attracted more and more support, not only from Marlon Brando, but from Dick Gregory and um, Jane Fonda uh, celebrities all around the country. Uh, there were churches and ministers who came to the support of Indian groups, and it looked very much like the civil rights struggle of the South. And in fact, Bruce Wilkie, who was a macaw, and if you read my book, he's the young man who got me involved with Indians to begin with. He told me, point blank, he said, we've seen what the black people did in the South. They've had their sit-ins, 
we're going to have fish ins. And they did. And it worked. Yes, sir. In 1947, the state of Washington passed a far reaching forest practices act that over overturned a whole bunch of uh, lodging practices, which and which had a substantial impact on fisheries and other resources. It went to appeal on the U.S. Supreme Court. It was sustained as a perfect use of the police power authority of the state of Washington found challenged by various, uh, various groups. I, I think it was probably the, um, was the Judge Bolt decision that really brought the Modern Force Practices Act in 1974 and ultimately put the, the tribe in, in a negotiation status in, in the 1980s, middle 1980s, with the uh, Timber Fish and Wildlife. And it was probably the specter of the phase two Judge Bolt decision that really brought the forest and fish that great uh, regulation to bear. Uh, would you comment on, on phase two and what, what your view of how that works? Yeah, the, the phrase is probably not familiar to most of you, phase two. Uh, when you think of the Bolt decision, you think there's only one decision, but that decision was phase one. Um, I was actually uh, involved in creating what came to be known as phase two. Um, although we were asked by our client, the Makai Indian tribe, to enter the case on their behalf, other tribes came to us and said, would you represent us in this case as well? So we ended up representing the Quileutes uh, and the Lummi, as well as the Macaws. Uh, in connection with the Lummi case, I went up to the Lummi reservation I'd actually, we had actually been retained by the Lummies before the case was brought. And when I went up there and I talked to the Lummi fishermen and the people, they said, you know, it isn't just a matter of uh, the treaty right, but look what's going on in the river. Um, the, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the river up there, this, uh, what is it? Nooksack. Nooksack, thank you. You know, you get to be 81 and things start falling out of your head. Um, they said to me, look, you got chemical plants that are dumping chemicals in the river. You've got farms that are dumping uh, animal waste and fertilizer in the river. And we've seen the, the runs going down year after year after year. Uh, shouldn't we have a treaty right to stop that? And I said, yes, you should. So at the stage of drafting the complaint, which is the first step in any lawsuit, I drafted a complaint on behalf of the Lummi tribe, and I alleged certain counts. And then I got to a separate set of counts on the environmental ground, and I alleged all these actions were taken with the express authority of the state. The state had issued discharge permits to all of these polluters, and I said they were destroying the resource. Without the resource, the treaty is an empty right. Uh, I believe there was, it was the Squaxin Island tribe that made a similar allegation. So in one of our pretrial meetings with Judge Bolt, he looked at that and he said, this is a very important issue, but I think I should decide first, what does the treaty mean? What is the scope of the treaty? So let's reserve that to a separate phase. We'll call that phase two. That was phase two. Well, we didn't get to phase two for 30 years. Uh, the case was decided in 1974. Actually, the Supreme Court decision came down in 79. Um, other tribes tried to bring suit against the state for violating phase two. They brought, they didn't bring suit, but they tried it as a sub-proceeding of U.S. versus Washington. And the case got as far as the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, you gotta present us with a specific set of facts. You can't just allege a general right. And if you can present us with a specific set of facts where the state has actually taken action that damages the environment and diminishes the fish runs, then we will rule on it. The lawyers for the tribes got together, this was after I retired in 94, and they brought a case based on culverts, 
the culverts that the state had constructed in highways, which interfered with the passage of fish upstreams. And it's known as the culverts case, but it's really phase two of the original U.S. versus Washington. Uh, the court has not finally ruled on that unless it happened and I didn't hear about it because what happened was uh, the state was scared to death of what a final ruling would mean because the cost of replacing uh, and enlarging all these culverts was astronomical. And the state got together with the tribes and said, let's sit down and bargain about this. Let's try to resolve this like gentlemen and not go to court over it. As far as I know, the last I've heard, they're still negotiating. The state has, yes, Fronda? Uh, the negotiations failed. It went to trial last October, and we're awaiting a decision. Who's the judge? Ricardo Martinez. Oh, thanks for bringing me up to date. Last October, that was after I wrote my book. Okay, I don't have to worry about it being negligent then. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, can you speak about the uh, political power that the tribes have received through gaming and if that is even comparable to fishing or if that has actually increased their, uh, their power and their recognition? Well, gaming was not something I was involved in. Uh, we didn't do any work in the area of casinos. Um, for one thing, the tribes we represented didn't have casinos on their reservation. But I've been an observer, and I've watched what's happened. Um, and I do know that one of the tribes we represent, the Mille Lacs Chippewa in, in Minnesota, have two hugely successful casinos. And these casinos, as you know, generate large sums of money. The tribes have learned how to play the game. Of course, you've all heard of Abramoff, Jack Abramoff, who was a pretty ruthless exploiter. Uh, but apart from Abramoff, the Washington State tribes have contributed to political campaigns. They contributed heavily to Maria Cantwell's campaign, and she defeated Slade Gorton, which didn't bring any tears to the eyes of the Indians of this state. Um, it has increased their political power simply because when you have money, and we've been hearing a lot about this recently, our political system runs on money. And the tribes were essentially non-players until they got casino money. Now they're players. Uh, they have Washington, D.C. representation. They have uh, lawyers who understand the influence that money brings. So I would answer your question by saying that, in my opinion, casinos have enormously increased the importance that tribes have to office holders. They cannot be ignored as a kind of a pathetic little group of people who live on some reservation somewhere. They have political status, they have money, and they have voice. Personally, even though none of the tribes I represent are, except the Mille Lacs, and we don't have anything to do with their casino, um, I've never been involved in the gaming stuff, but I am delighted. I am thrilled because for many years, the issue that you heard discussed at every Indian conference was economic development, economic development. And it's as though that was a magic phrase. You could somehow collect a group of experts and bring economic development to the reservation. It turned out to be extremely difficult to do. And it wasn't until the gaming came along that tribes began to see real money. Um, I'm thrilled to death because here in the state of Washington, uh, there, there's two tribes that have made money at gaming. One is Muckleshoot and the other is uh, Puyallup. Both of them were pathetic little bands of people who were 
living from hand to mouth. They had very little land. They were not widely respected. And that has changed enormously. And, you know, a lot of non-Indian audiences ask me, well, what about this gaming? That isn't Indian, is it? Oh, yes, it is. Always has been. Uh, and the history of Indian casinos in the state of Washington and elsewhere is very enlightening because it came about when Indian tribes began, starting with bingo, uh, the state tried to crack down on their gambling, gaming, saying that was too big, too much money. And they tried to shut them down. Well, of course, they don't have any jurisdiction over the tribes. So in one case, they went to federal court. It was the Cabazon Band in California. And the court ruled that a federal law called the Assimilative Crimes Act, which is a, a law that makes it a, a crime to do anything on an Indian reservation that is a crime on state land, is also a crime on an Indian reservation. But the court ruled that the state permits bingo by charitable groups, the American Legion, the VFW. So the state cannot deny Indian tribes the right to engage in the same activity. And that led to the growth of casinos. Well, the states were scared to death that they couldn't control this because they couldn't impose their authority over Indian lands. So what did they do? They ran to Congress. They said, you've got to put a stop to this. Well, you know what happens when things get into the Congress. Uh, what came out was the Indian Gaming Act, which uh, legitimized Indian gaming and set up a federal Indian Gaming Commission and set up requirements that a certain percentage of the revenue had to be distributed to the members of the tribe um, and regulated it. It also said that uh, tribes could negotiate, would, would, would be able to negotiate compacts. What is a compact? Well, it's an agreement between two governments uh, that would govern or regulate the size of the gaming operation. But it had a hook, a hooker in there. It said, if the state does not negotiate in good faith, then the tribe is free to go forward without state approval. And the Spokane tribe here in the state of Washington gave up on trying to negotiate a compact with the state of Washington and went ahead and proved that the state hadn't negotiated in good faith, so the state had no hold on them. So the Indian Gaming Act has not been of much help to the states. The tribes themselves have been a help to the states because many of the tribes voluntarily pay to local government sums for services, law enforcement, uh, road maintenance, uh, other services. And of course, as you know, the tribes dedicate a large portion of their income to social services for their own members. Now, I think you might ask Donald Trump how much he devotes of his casino's income to social services. Not much. Um, and so on those reservations, like Muckleshoot, you will see the evidence of prosperity everywhere. Yes, sir. Um, well, do you think it's important to have the casinos and gaming as given? I can't uh, comment on your cousin because I don't know him and I don't know how much he, know he really knows. Um, 
I do know that the non-Indian casinos have been very, very closely watching Indian gaming to see if they could come up with any evidence of criminal participation or corruption in order to get federal legislation. So far, without success. Uh, the Indian casinos have kept criminal elements out. Anytime you have a huge flow of money, you're going to get some corruption. You're going to get some diversion that is unauthorized. But um, you know the tribes are essentially democracies. The governing body is an elected body. And if they try to divert all the money into their own pockets, they will get kicked out of office. So I don't know the real story of Talila, but I suspect your cousin doesn't either. Um, I'm just saying that so far I have not heard any case of major corruption uh, of, by an Indian casino. It didn't, it didn't suggest criminal activity, but just that um, only a small percentage is really profiting from this. Well, he would need to see the actual breakdown of the expenditures of the revenues because a lot of that money goes into tribal programs, which he may not see. There are alcoholism treatment programs, there are uh, youth programs, there are all kinds of programs. Yes, sir. Well, a couple of quick examples. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, uh, gambling, per se, but um, the Chehalis tribe has just opened some beautiful, huge new buildings, social services, youth programs, the same thing with the Nisqually tribe. Uh, the Puyallup tribe or Chehalis tribe, any kid who wants to go to college and has decent grades, well, their, their college tuition will be paid. Those are some of the... Um, you know, residuals from casino and having that economic power. So it's a balance. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a very elemental question, I think. How is it, or is it, are our tribal members citizens of the U.S.? Yes. As well as citizens of the sovereign nation? Yes. And then as such, they have rights under both citizenship? Yes. And, and that was granted when they were, when they formed the treaties? No. No. It was an act of Congress in 1924. Um, I've read, I don't know how correct this is, that Congress acted uh, out of gratitude for the service that Indians performed uh, in the military during World War I. Um, and Congress has done that. Um, for example, after World War II, where many Indians served in the military and served heroically, the Congress passed the Indian Claims Act uh, in an effort to address questions of injustice that had been perpetrated on Indian tribes, lands taken without fair compensation. So the Indian Claims Act was another case of Congress responding to Indian heroism. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of things. Some of you may be very familiar with Indian life, uh, but if you are, you know that Indian people honor their members who serve in the military. They um, treat them as warriors. Um, you know, the first woman who was killed in the Iraq War was a Hopi Navajo woman named Lori Timentua. Uh, and there was a flap because the state of Arizona wanted to name a mountain peak after her. It was called Squaw Mountain, which, as many of you know, is, a, is an insulting term to Indians. Uh, and they wanted to change it to uh, Timentua Peak. Uh, there was an actual battle over this in the Arizona legislature. and. In fact, the U.S. Coast and Geodesic Survey, which also has a role in naming lands, landmark features, weighed in on this. And there was, there's a rule that you, you can't do it until at least five years have passed following the death of a person. But th there was so much momentum for this that they named the peak after her. Um, last summer, I was asked to go to the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in eastern Montana by the president of the tribe 
to be honored by the tribe. Uh, it was, came out of the blue because I hadn't been out to that reservation in 10 years. And the last work we, I had participated in was 30 years earlier. I didn't know why they wanted to recognize me now. Um, but I went out there with my partner who still works for the, does work for the tribe. The Northern Cheyenne are a very military people. They're very fierce. Uh, they and the Sioux were the ones who defeated Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn, which took place not far from the reservation. Uh, and I went out to the uh, powwow grounds. They invited me to attend their powwow. And uh, the powwow grounds are about a mile out of the town where the tribe's headquarters are, Lame Deer. And as you approach the grounds, you can see teepees all over the place. It looked like a scene out of the 19th century. Um, and we came into the stands, a kind of a circular arena. Uh, it was almost entirely uh, populated by Indian people, very few white people, because uh, lame deer is off the beaten path. You don't go there unless you really want to go to lame deer. And uh, uh, there was a, uh, an arena, kind of a dirt arena with grandstands in a circle around it. And the honor guard formed to enter the arena. And the announcer proudly announced the names of each of the members of the Northern Cheyenne tribe who were in uniform as they marched in, carrying, their, carrying the US flag. And it was clear that he was saying, these, we honor these people. These people are serving the United States. Now, you would think in light of some of the terrible things that the United States Army did to the Northern Cheyenne. They might be bitter about the United States, but you wouldn't know it from watching those military people march in. They honor them. I'll just tell a little per personal anecdote and try to wrap it up after this because I don't want to push my voice too far. Um, I didn't know why they were calling me out there, but we had we, meaning I and my law firm, had represented them in a very important dispute with major coal companies in the 70s. Coal companies were trying to enforce leases that would have allowed them to strip mine roughly two thirds of the reservation. Uh, and when the Cheyenne realized what that would do, they wanted no part of it and they, they hired us to stop it. And we did. We, we went to work and we did a, a very exhaustive investigation and we found that these leases were completely illegal. Uh, and eventually the Secretary of Interior uh, ruled that those leases couldn't be acted on and eventually they all left the reservation and they had to pay damages for what they had done while they were there. Well, that happened in the 70s. So here I am in 2009. Um, sitting in the grandstand out there. And the president of the tribe called me in over the loudspeaker and said, well, Al Zions, come up here. So I went up in front and he pointed to a chair that he had there and he read to the crowd what I had done. What actually wasn't me, me it was my partner, Steve Chestnut and I and others. Uh, and then he said, we'd like you to kind of walk around the, the grounds here so that everybody can see you. So we walked in a circle and behind us came a parade of Indian dancers all in full regalia. And then we stopped and he said, anybody that wants to come down and thank Al for what he's done for us, saved our lands, come down. And with that, people, men, women, children, 12, 13 years old, came down and walked across the arena, came over to me and shook my hand and said, thank you. Now, you don't get that practicing real estate law in downtown Seattle. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>